All right, Eric, to everybody, welcome. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome really uh, the opening, uh, almost the uh, last of the, the the end of last year, beginning of the new year, as we come to the really end of the tour reading. And it's a pleasure to welcome for the first time making his tour motion debut, Robert Stephen Gottlieb, who um, was in Toronto the past couple of years as a member of the Beit Midrash Tzich and the uh, head um assistant rabbi at the village school here in Toronto. He has now moved to Ottawa, where he is the director of the JET, Ottawa's Capital Jewish Experience, and uh, trying to build up with uh, think young people in Ottawa. Ottawa is a very nice city. It's uh, not quite quite Toronto, but of course, it's the capital of Canada. And he's the interim rabbi of the Young Israel of Ottawa, as you heard us uh, uh, talking. He, he worked at... Um, at Congregation Shared Israel in New York, the Spanish and Portuguese school, a graduate of Rutgers University, uh, received received his smicha at Yeshiva University, a uh, degree from Furkov School of Psychology. And uh, we wish him much Hatzlaka, really. I think he's taking on a, uh, to create a new organization in Ottawa from scratch, Yesh Mayayin, as someone who sort of did the same thing in Toronto. I know what it's like, so I wish you much, much Hatzlaka and welcome aboard. Vakasha. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kellerman. It's uh, it's really nice to be here, and it's nice to uh, be back in Toronto in spirit, uh, virtually, if not in person. So thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, as you know, Sukkot is coming up, and when I was thinking about what to do for uh, for this year, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about ideas revolving in Sukkot, but also general ideas of how we can relate to our own experience as Jews broadly. So I want to take some lessons from Sukkot particularly where we have the tension between the universal and the particular nature of Sukkot, and see if we can learn something from that about how we relate ourselves as Jews who are, let's say, religious Zionist. Obviously, both of those words have many connotations, but very broadly defined, and I'll let you make the definition in your head of what that means. I also want to point out that despite talking about religious Zionism, we're not going to talk about religious Zionists which is to say that this will not weigh in any way, shape, or form uh, in controversies going on in Israel or those perspectives. It's more for our own relationship from a religious perspective. So with that having been said, maybe disappointing some, maybe making some happy, uh, we'll jump right in to some of the sources that I have. And the first one really starts in the Haftarah that we'll be reading very, uh, very soon, which is from Zechariah. I'll just read in English for the sake of for the sake of time, so that we can get into uh, more discussion. But the Hebrew is all here, keeping me honest as well. All who survive and all those nations that come up against Jerusalem shall make a pilgrimage year, uh, year by year, to bow low to the King Hashem, you know Hashem Sivakot, uh, and to observe uh, Sukkot. So this is very much a telling of the future, where we will have everyone coming together very universalist, very much on the same page, not necessarily all Jews, but all coming in worship together at one particular particular time. Rabbi Malamed in Pinene Halacha actually takes this idea as well, writing that we learn from Zechariah that in the future, Sukkot will be a touchstone for the nations of the world. And Evan Bochen, that everyone who goes to Jerusalem to bow down to Hashem and celebrate uh, for Sukkot will receive blessing. So it's going to be open to everyone, not only Jews. So this paints a very, again, universal picture, a picture of people being able to come together, being able to celebrate together, worshiping the same God. It's really a great time for everyone. We also have an idea, departing a little bit from this everyone together, but still having the sense of universalism, the Gemara in none other than Mesecha Sukkah. What is what with these 70 extra sacrifices that we have on Sukkot? They are related to the 70 nations of the world. Uh, they each have their own individual offering that is brought on their behalf. They correspond to them and bringing them together will bring us closer to having that world where we are all truly together. But then, of course, the eighth day comes, and there's only one that is offered. What's up with that? That is the 
Uma Yechida, the one nation that is Israel, that is ours in particular. And so the Gemara gives us a mushal. Mushal of Melech Basar Vadam. It's a mushal of a human king. Sha'amar Lavadav Asu Li Suda Gedola. Make me a big feast. Um... But on the last day, rather than having the big feast where everyone is welcome, you know, the big Shabbos dinner where everyone and their cousins are invited to come together uh, to the house, rather the last day, it's your favorite guest. You're saying, you're going to join me privately. You're going to come here and we're going to have a private one-on-one meal uh, together. And that's to celebrate that special love that is that is there. And says Rabbi Yochanan, Oy lehem The goyim say, Oy, what's what, what's with them? Or we say Oy for them actually, because now there's no base amikdash, there's no one to bring sacrifices for them. So this is really wrestling that tension in many ways. On the one hand, we see sacrifices on behalf of other nations. This is the Jewish people caring for their relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, being part of one overarching system that is related on both sides, Jew and non-Jew alike. This is the Jews taking a universalist stand for other people, yet at the same time maintaining a particularist relationship with Hashem that is at that core, a special relationship that is unique from the other nations, and in fact, taking it on behalf of them and actually even feeling bad when that temple is no longer there. So who's making sacrifices for them? Because the Jews are still that intermediary that's there. So this is very much a middle position. If we had in the beginning, everyone's coming together, everyone's sacrificing together. So now we have a point that's a little bit more complicated, but still fundamentally is about this shared idea and shared vision though in a little bit of a more particularist way. But we go down a little farther and we get a little more uh, particularist as we go. We have another Gemara, this one in Mesechah Savoda Zara. The non-Jews say, Hashem, why don't you give us Shabbos? Why don't you give us a mitzvah? And he says, well, you need to actually prepare for Shabbos. And once you prepare for Shabbos and you have Shabbos, so then there you go. But if you're not going to prepare for it, you're not going to put in the effort, you're not going to work towards it, then you don't get Shabbos. That, that, simple enough. Ela afal pichain, mitzvah kala. But I have a light mitzvah that I can give you. Yesh li, uh, uh, I'm sorry, mitzvah kala yesh li. I have a mitzvah that I can give you that's a lighter mitzvah. Sukkah, very easy. My karele mitzvah kala. Why is it called a mitzvah kala? Why are we insulting sukkah? Why is it, why are we saying that it's light? Uh, it doesn't come with a monetary loss that's involved. Now you might be thinking, well, yes, it does. Sukkahs are very expensive. You know, we just blew uh, eight hundred dollars on a sukkah. But back then, the sukkah is really you know you put up a little hut. It's a little, it's a simple thing. But the Gemara continues, They'll all make the sukkahs on their, uh, their roofs. He'll make it hot. The sun will come down, or as the case in, uh, in Toronto, or certainly in Ottawa, maybe he'll make it cold, and you won't be able to uh, put in the effort to actually stay there. And so what happens? They will... Toss down their sukkahs called echad ve'echad. Invite Zukaso. They will knock down their sukkahs and say that's enough. So not a very high opinion. Still something that's offered there, but not a very high opinion of what's actually going to be uh, coming from this. And I have the English translation there with all of the uh, emendations of the English translation from the Koran. If anyone wants to take a look behind it, just to see more context there. But Again, now this is getting a little bit farther away from that universalist picture. Still has those tendencies in some ways. It still has the offer of a mitzvah to now use an offer of, partici- of participation. It just doesn't expect them to actually participate. 
but it's still wrestling in many ways, this Gemara, with that tension between the particular and the universal. Uh, but as we continue through, we see that it gets uh, a little different. This is coming from a Medrash in Vayik Rabba now. Uh, so we have this idea of this complete joy that's in Tehillim. Al Tehi Korechen Ella Sheva Smachos. Don't read it as Sova Smachos as full joy. Rather read it as Sheva Smachos, seven joys. Those being um, Sheva Mitzvos Shachag. Those being seven mitzvos that are related to the holiday of Sukkot. Eluhain Arba, meaning Shabalulav, you have the four species, Sukkah, Chagiga, the Karban Chagiga, and Simcha, Korba, and Simcha, this happiness, and another uh, that's there. Now, here's the question, Im Simcha, Lama Chagiga. If you have happiness and joy already, why do you need the Korban Chagiga? The Im Chagiga, if you have the Korban Chagiga, Lama Simcha, why do you need these Smachos? Amar Rabbi Avin, Mushal, sometimes the nickname is to Eitzel, Hadayan, Velez, Anan, Yadayan, Man, who, no, Tseach, to go into a room. Uh, we weren't in the room where it happens. We don't know who's going to be victorious. We don't know who's going to take uh, take lead. So how do you know whoever comes out holding the Lulav, that is who we can assume is the winner. They're having, they're holding that branch and they are uh, holding it proud. My father-in-law actually says that uh, some of the imagery that we see on Sukkot, particularly in more, um, let's say, formal settings. So, for example, as Rabbi Kelman said, I worked at the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue in New York City for a little for a little bit. My father-in-law is the chazan there. And they are very regal in how they do their hushanos. You're walking around with the, with the lulav in hand, like you literally like you have a sword at your shoulder. And it's very, it's very regal. It's a very slow procession. They don't do any of the uh, fast-paced dancing that uh, that you would expect. And at certain times in the service, they actually have the balt fila flanked on both sides by people holding their uh, their lulavim. Also, it's very, very much like a like a sword. There, it's like a royal guard. They actually have a whole routine where the two will come and cross behind them and then go to the side. It's almost like you're watching a knighting ceremony. It's very interesting. Um, so, you know, my father-in-law would use would probably use a source like this as a raya towards something like that, that we have our swords, that we were victorious. But what the Midrash is saying is that, you know, we won. I'll just read in English there. So too Israel and the nations of the world come and prosecute each other, battling with each other. Now, Russia, Sunday, we don't know who won. But when we see that Israel comes holding their lulavs and their, uh, and their esrogim, we know that they that we were the winner. We had a, a big battle on Rosh Hashanah, and Sukkot is our victory celebration in uh, in that regard. And so this one is again taking that particularist stance. This time, making that tension really palpable. Literally, there's a battle between uh, Israel and other nations going on here. So what we've seen, just to take stock, this was really uh, introductory. To, uh, to the point that I want to really address and really dive into, what we've seen so far is different sources within the tradition that have different degrees of universalism or particularism that Sukkot is supposed to invoke in us. We saw in the sources that we looked at first, very much a universalist position, a position that Jews and non-Jews come together, worship together, or sharing in that. We saw then having a little bit more of the tension coming in. We're not worshiping together, but Israel is worshiping on behalf of non-Jews. We still care about their spiritual health in a significant way, not adversarial, just a different kind of relationship with Hashem. You know, if we were to invoke maybe uh, Michael Wishagrad, for example, you have uh, any love comes with favoritism necessarily, he would say, and the love of God for the Jewish people then necessarily is favorable over and on, but there's still love there for everyone. It's just a different kind of love or a different level of love, I should say. Um, though there are other ways of thinking about that than just Wishagrad's approach there. Uh, but we get more particularist as we go. We get to the point where we say, you know, here's a here's a mitzvah, you can do it, but there's no expectation that they actually will. In fact, the expectation is that they'll shove it back in our face. And then we finally have here an actual explicit battle between Israel and 
non-Jewish nations where Israel is the one that comes out victorious. And I think this really highlights a tension that a lot of people face in their religious lives between the universal and the particular. How much do we, excuse me, how much do we have our own unique position and approach to the exclusion of other approaches? And how much are we able to not only allow in, in a, you know, let's say the tension of Torah Umada, Torah Im Derech Eretz sense, but how much do we actually need to care about what's going on uh, amongst others? And how do we relate to that? And I want to bracket this off only for, uh, for a moment. We will get back to it. But I want to look at this now through a different lens, not the lens of Sukkis, but the lens of how Jews in the diaspora relate to uh, the modern state of Israel in general, uh, the modern state of Israel, sorry, in particular, and the land of Israel as the Holy Land in general. And to do that, I want to actually look at part of an essay that was written several years ago. It was actually written while I was in uh, Smicha at YU by Rabbi Tuli Hartstark, who's the head of school at SAR, one of the uh, Jewish high schools in Riverdale, New York. So he wrote this, uh, this article, Israel Diaspora and Religious Zionist Education in America, easily accessible online. You can search the, uh, the name of it and easily find the full article. I think this paragraph summarizes the points that he makes and will serve as a good jumping off point for this broader discussion. So he says, thus far, we've articulated four models of the relationship between Israel and diaspora. And here we'll just summarize what those models are. If you want to read his, uh, his supporting points and his uh, challenge points for each of them, you are welcome to find the full article. Um, but he says, number one is the negation of exile. This idea that all Jews belong in Israel no matter what, and life outside of Israel is not an authentic Jewish life. Full stop. That's uh, that's the end of the question. You're either it, you either have already made Aliyah or haven't made Aliyah yet. But if you're not in one of those two camps, then life is life is simply religiously inauthentic. You know, mitzvahs are just for practice. You're not actually doing anything. What are you doing here? And I'm sure that we can all think of people who have that uh, that kind of approach, that kind of mentality. It's certainly one with precedent. So that's one idea. The second idea, which is really the opposite extreme that he lays out, is what he calls the diasporist model, which is basically saying that Jews belong in the diaspora, whether that's from a uh, let's let's say um, let's say extreme traditionalist perspective of Hashem hasn't brought us back to the land yet in a uh, clear way, which obviously many modern Orthodox Jews who follow in the uh, School of thought of Rav Soloveitchik would, I think, I think reject, um, or from the perspective of why are we putting all our eggs in one basket? We should, uh, we should specifically be spread out. Um, there are people who have who have that view. There was actually one on a podcast that made a lot of controversy in a podcast called Orthodox Conundrum. You can look it up. I forget who the speaker was, um, but a lot of people were complaining about it. I remember that. We're all Jews. We always complain about about things. Um, but that's another model where you, you actually take the opposite approach. Then number three that he has is that you have a center and periphery. He identifies this with, with Achad Ha'am. And that's that Israel is at the center of existence. And diaspora is peripheral communities that draw their meaning, draw their energy from that cultural center um, and relate to it as that is the center. You're very clear about that but you're still there on the periphery and that still has a sense of meaning and value and purpose. Again, he identifies this mostly with the thinker Achad Ha'am. And then finally, number four that he lays out is a model called the dual center model. And that he says is that the life of the Jewish people has flourished in two parallel centers. Israel is one of those centers and it's definitely a center both culturally and religiously. And it's something that's important and has religious significance. But guess what? There's another center for uh, Jewish life in the diaspora. Now, where exactly is that center is a good question. Probably any community that's particularly sizable, people will argue is that center. Um, but he says that very much is another center of Judaism with its own approach, its own style, and it is religiously legitimate and should always and should always kind of stick around. 
So he says those are the four models that you can see, and you can basically trace any religious any perspective onto uh, one of those four models. Now, then he gets into his own position. So he says these parallel centers complement and enrich each other, having developed their own independent uh, and interdependent Jewish cultures. In recent years, I, I meaning him, uh, have become very moved by the uh, dual center model. Uh, Zion, he says Zionism need not and should not discount the diaspora community. There are nationalistic, ethical, and pragmatic reasons to openly acknowledge and support diaspora Judaism. Again, he lays out exactly what those concerns are in the article. You are welcome to read it to, uh, to get into that. Um, in negating the diaspora, he says, theorists have manipulated the way we read our past and narrate our present. Uh, refashioning the Israel-diaspora relationship can help us better prepare for the future. It can reshape our understanding of Jewish national identity and our ultimate goals as people. So he's very much a fan of this idea that you have the two centers and they are both independent and interdependent, influencing each other, but nonetheless separate with their own reasons to exist and their own reasons to support each other. And that's very much the model that he uh, that he pushes for there. If we were thinking about it in light of how we relate to the outside world, so you would have then both ideals. You would have the Israel is the center, that's where is one center, that's where we are our most together, we can say. And the diaspora, you have another center, and that's where we're most outward facing. So rather, Israel would be inward facing, and the diaspora model would be outward facing towards the world as a light onto nations. And that's really what he pushes very strongly for. He says it's unfortunate when you have people who reject the notion of a diaspora, you know, the types who are saying you either uh, are making out, have made Aliyah, or have not yet made Aliyah, but it's one of those two options. He thinks that that does a tremendous disservice. Many religious Zionists would disagree would disagree with that. I'm not going to make a claim one way or the other, uh, at least publicly. But this is the position that he uh, that he lays out. Now, one of my friends from Smicha, Rabbi Avram Wine, who is currently the assistant rabbi at uh, Congregation Keter Torah in Teaneck, New Jersey, so he has a forthcoming article. I don't believe it's been published yet, but he let me he let me quote this uh, because I think that it's uh, a very powerful response to that, where he is directly responding to Rabbi Hartstark's essay. Um, it might actually be out by now. You can you can Google the name of it, and if, it's, uh, if you find it, then it's out. Um, and so he says, I believe that there's another model here that neither demeans those who live outside of Israel or diminishes the significance of their religious Zionism and observance, nor presents the diaspora as an equally valid center of the Jewish people. Meaning all of these are false dichotomies. It's not one or the other. And he calls this the headquarters and embassy approach. He says Medinat Yisrael is the headquarters of the Jewish people. We, we can acknowledge that. It's the center very much, culturally, Torah, all of that. And diaspora communities, he says, are embassies of the state, official representatives, so to speak. The diaspora communities are critical institutions connected to and extensions of Midiat Yisrael that make valuable contribu contributions, but they are embassies, not another center. So I, I, I like this approach, not just because I live in Ottawa, but because I think it makes a lot of sense to think about. It really shows that everyone's on the same, on the same page. You have the inward facing self-governing country model where everyone is there and it is the center. But you also have a real proper reason to be beyond it. It's very similar to that center periphery model. He's going to get into that. Um, but it is uh, still it's still different in that here they are both presenting a uh, a similar path. So he actually he actually says a similar possibility to the center periphery model, um, but it spends more than two sentences on this uh, on this option. Furthermore. He attributes it to Ahad Ha'am, but does not consider the major religious Zionist thinkers who promote a similar model. Um, so that's just his uh, his gripe with that. But this model is saying we're all on the same page, and we are in the diaspora a representative of a broader ideal. We're wearing a particular jersey. We're representing a particular team that goes beyond us and our particular location, 
whether in you know Toronto, Ottawa, New York, Chicago, insert uh, insert community here. Um, but it acknowledges we're on the same team. We're not in this alone. And he says this approach grants legitimacy to those who live in the diaspora while not in any way equating our biblical homeland with other places. We're not saying that it's as holy as being in Israel. We're not saying it's as um, fulfilling necessarily as living in Israel. But there is a purpose in being there. And it is as a representative of something that is bigger. And he says, though there are certainly other views within the religious Zionist camp, the proponents of this model likely being in a minority, uh, he says that this approach is the one that's celebrated uh, most directly by the rebbeim of uh, Yeshiva University and uh, uh, Gush Etzion and other places. He, he lists specifically Rabbi Michal Rosenzweig, Rabbi Moshe Lichtenstein, uh, and of course, Rev Soloveitchik and Rev Lichtenstein. And so this is a model that uh, I think is particularly powerful, and that might be, uh, you know, laying my cards a little bit out on the table there, but I won't comment on that publicly. But we do have uh, all these models that are that are at play. Now, what does this have to do with the particular versus, uni versus universalism? I want to argue that the way that we think about our relationship to the Holy Land is, in fact, very similar to how we then relate to those outside of us in general. And how we think about our relationship with uh, religious Zionism, religious nationalism, whatever word you want to use for that, will necessarily impact how we view our role to the broader world in which we live. If we see ourselves as just being out there to go to Israel and form our own country and self-govern and defend our borders and all of that, that will impact how we view other people. If we view ourselves as saying, oh, I'm never going to step foot in Israel because I'm living a perfectly fulfilling religious life here and this is the only country that I need, that will also impact how we view not only others, but how we view Jews who view Israel differently than us. So it's very important to understand in our own lives, which approach do we have? Why do we have it? Is it religiously valid? And how am I using it to move forward in a productive direction for myself? Now, before we actually unpack exactly what that means, I want to bring this together with the Sukkot idea in the writings of Rav Shagar, Rav Shimon Gershon Rosenberg, who is the uh, founding Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Siach Yitzchak. Uh, he has many, many works, both in English and Hebrew, that are absolutely wonderful. Um, and this is actually from an English volume that he that he put out. I, I say he put out, but he was uh, he was nifter by the time it, by the time it came out. Koren Magid put it out, called Faith Shattered and Restored. Excellent volume, highly, highly recommend it for those who want to read Rav Shigar in English. Uh, if you want to read it in Hebrew, this same article is printed in a volume called Sherit Emuna, uh, which is also fascinating, has actually completely parenthetically my favorite essay of his of all time, which involves the relationship between Judaism, postmodernism, and The Matrix, uh, the movie The Matrix, uh, but I won't spoil that one. You'll have to, you'll have to buy that and read it for yourself. But he actually brings us into direct conversation with Sukkot. So he says the insecurity of the diaspora, meaning many people, many Jews who are in diaspora don't really understand exactly what we're doing. How do we relate to Israel? Because that insecurity, he says, must actually deeply inform our confidence as inheritors of the land. When you have an insecurity of what's going on, where you're going to be, where are you going to be next? That gives a certain level of humility, a certain experience that Rav Shigar actually argues should translate onto even those who are very firmly in the land, very firmly uh, part of that battle to take it and to utilize it towards our religious ends. He says, otherwise, confidence will denigrate into hubris, into the sense that all is due to my power and the might of my hand. And such a state of mind precludes faithful devotion to God and the sensitivity to the suffering of the strangers in our midst, a quality that we were dispersed to the ends of the earth in order to acquire, right? We go back and we completely forget about the experience of exile and what it was like, then what are we going to turn into as a result of that? We'll become callous, we'll become overconfident, overzealous. It'll lead to forgetting that there are people that we are interacting with generally. And he says, thus it is precisely the diasporic nature of the sukkah 
the very sukkah in which God commanded us to dwell when we emerged from Egypt, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God, where one surrenders one's power and puts his trust in God that can facilitate an all-encompassing divine influx that includes the offering of 70 bulls for the welfare of the world's nation. Sukkah, he says, the sukkah, the mitzvah of sukkah, is paradigmatic of our ideal relationship with the diaspora. And that's true in a few different ways. Most directly here, when we're putting our trust in Hashem, we're in that sukkah, literally a temporary dwelling, and we don't know what it's gonna what it's gonna be like. We're out of the comfort of our home. That facilitates a connection with the divine, but with all around us as well, which itself leads to our concern for what is around us. It's a very powerful idea. But he says there's more to it. Because ultimately, both of these extremes, you can call them particularism and universalism or nationalism and universalism, are necessary and important features of our religious lives. It says nationalism fundamentally is rootedness in what one is an identity unique to the nation and the individual. It's a culture that we're born into, that we know, that we live, that we breathe, that is a part of us through good, through bad, for our entire lives. Something that we always have that literally roots us into our ground and our community in a a true way. But he says that if it is not to turn rigid and callous, we need to temper it with a healthy dose of universalism. Universalism subverts the preference for one national identity over another, as well as the very authentic existence of that identity. That's because universalism is the shared dimension, the common ground of all humankind. Put in religious terms, it's where we encounter the image of God. From this point of view, the human is real, and nationalism is merely a later malleable construct. This is getting into a little bit of postmodern theory. You need to really read the full article to understand where he's going with it. Um, But what he's saying fundamentally is that in order to not be so overconfident in ourselves and in that rooted identity, so as not to become callous and cruel, we need to allow ourselves to see that there is more that is beyond us, that we can connect to more. We can see the image of God elsewhere as well. He says, conversely, universalism must be augmented with nationalism. Because if we only have universalism, that's also not going to lead to a particularly productive end. He says, universalism is is an abstraction in that it makes all human beings identical, effacing the very real differences between people, right? We're eliminating differences. Literally, we are becoming universal. We're taking away those particulars, and that is equally problematic. Nationalism, for its part, he says, emphasizes the other's difference and immutability, right? Rav Soloveitchik wrote a lot about in in Confrontation how sometimes there are just two different ways of looking at the world and, you know, you don't need to try to convince the other to change their position to productively come together. And so universalism really has its, uh, has its limits. He says, true, in modern philosophy, we encounter a different reading of universalism based on accepting the other's difference, um, on the fact that no two people are comparable. Each has his place in the world, fine. But even this view of universalism requires some form of nationalism or particularism. Again, I think you can use those interchangeably here. For universalism is at bottom a movement that denies identity. And that is why it makes it impossible to pinpoint how one person is preferable to another. The individual's place is defined not through the acknowledgement of his specific and coherent identity, but rather by his inaccessible otherness. There's no internalization of his uniqueness, only the incomparability to any other. Nationalism, or particularism, meanwhile, marks a resurgence of the specific immutable identity. So we need to have both. We need to have our identity, which is firm, which is proud, which is loud, which is there and part of us that we're willing to stand up for and we're willing to share and we're willing to fight for while also respecting that there are others who also have those values. When we have our self-confidence in what we believe, what we stand for and what roots us, 
then we can stand face to face with someone else who has that same thing going on and not have to worry about losing ourselves or our confidence in that. Rabbi Zagar says, in fact, that the sukkah is very much at the center of that. What is the sukkah? We're taking a piece of that instability and we are literally living in it. And we're taking something that's very visible. The sukkah, anyone can see who has a sukkah. You look in their yard, you can see it. It's very clear. It's very much there. It's not like a little mezuzah. You can have a dinky one behind your front door. No one will, no one will notice. When you have a sukkah up, you're making a statement. And you're saying that I am from somewhere else. Yes, I have this uh, nice, lovely house in Thornhill or wherever it might be. But I am fundamentally a resident of something that transcends this particular place. And I am prepared to go back to that and to celebrate that and to bring it into my life. In many ways, it's like a uniform that we're putting on. Rosh Hashanah notes, Jews oscillate between these two extremes, universalism and particularism, universalism and nationalism, very often between our shared humanity and the particular covenant of the Jewish people. He says it's a fertile opposition where the loss of one pole immediately damages the other. And he says the festival of Sukkot really represents the Jewish dichotomy between diaspora and homeland. The land of Israel's harvest festival, the sense of stability it induces, is celebrated in the sukkah, along with the exile, right? Along with that sense of uncertainty, unfamiliarity, uh, impermanence. All of that is celebrated in sukkah, and it reminds us how to properly temper ourselves moving forward to, again, give us that confidence and that rootedness, but also give us that awareness of what is going on around us, where we are within in context, and how we can best be a light unto others through that. So Sukkot in many ways is helping us charge our battery there, seeing the particular within the universal, as well as the universal within the particular. And even though different people will end up on different parts of that spectrum, because as Richard Gar said, we are all different people and we should celebrate that. We understand that we're coming from it from a similar place and that we're all fundamentally on that spectrum together moving in a similar direction. And that, I think, is a very powerful uh, realization to have. Now, where does that then leave in practice with Sukkis? So I have two ideas here that I want to that I want to share, and then we'll kind of bring everything together. Uh, one is from an article by Rabbi Yaakov Haber. Um, Rabbi Haber writes that Sukkah is one of the few mitzvot that encompass the entire body and all of life's activities, right? We eat in the sukkah, we sleep in the sukkah, we learn in the sukkah. Um, these are all parts of the mitzvah. These are all things that we are doing within it. We're literally making it our home. We're making we're making the temporary permanent and the permanent temporary on sukkahs. Indeed, the post game rule that even regular conversations with acquaintances ideally should take place in the sukkah. Thus, all apparently mundane activities can become acts of divine service, right? Sukkot is where we're celebrating that everything that we do, every word we speak, everything we eat, every act we are engaged in can itself be part of a mitzvah. The Mori Naim actually famously, famously and uh, probably anachronistically said the shorash of the word mitzvah is the Aramaic word savta, connection. You're connecting to Hashem when you do a mitzvah. And one who views mitzvot as all pervasive opportunities, Rabbi Haber writes, uh, for elevating every aspect of life, would also perform them with love and enthusiasm. When we see that they're all a connection to something greater than ourselves, we'll celebrate it with more confidence. That's just part of what it means to do that. And he says the nations reject the sukkah concept of life revolving around the divine command. Right, many uh, there are many religions that have a wonderfully robust uh, sense of connecting to spirituality, have a very robust prayer life, but at the end of the day, that connection in absolutely everything through commandments, through having a relationship of mitzvot, is something that is unique to the Jewish people, at least to the extent that we have it amongst us. He says, hence, they reject the entire message of Torah, which is fundamentally one of relations, one of uh, command, covenant, 
it's not just a uh, you know a nice book that we're getting nice moral lessons from. There it comes with rules. It comes with expectations that we need to actually actively meet throughout our life. Um, indeed, he says, unique korbanot are brought during the first seven days of Sukkot on behalf of the 70 nations of our world, because the Torah concerns itself with the benefit of all mankind and looks forward to the day when the nations will recognize Hashem's oneness. But the inner meaning of Sukkot, that idea of bringing everything we do into the Sukkah, uh, figuratively, shall we say, under the clouds of glory, through Hashem, that is something that is unique to the Jewish people. But in recognizing that, there's also something else we need to recognize. And here, uh, Rabbi Fruman, in his, uh, literally his, his tiny book, um, actually brings it out rather uh, well, I think, though, uh, though in a way that people might find a little strange. But if you, if you read Rabbi Fruman's uh, works and you're familiar with his writings, you'll understand that that uh, strangers is very much uh, to be expected. I'll just read it in English here. Um, this was translated by by my friend Rabbi Levi Morrow. Um, so he says, when Rav Fruman would walk into a sukkah, he would throw off his kippah. And he would say, he would quote from his, his son Yossi, that the uh, kippah might perhaps create a barrier between you and the sukkah, the schach, which is supposed to represent the Anani Hakava, the clouds of glory. And he says, I would take this view seriously. Now, does that mean he actually takes it seriously? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, but uh, it's something to think about. And he says, as a, as a little bit of a joke, a stribal, oh, that's definitely a barrier. But even a little knitted kippa, even a kippa spruga, so that can still be a barrier between it as well. Now, what does he mean by this? It's a, it's a funny statement, probably intentionally so. He wrote a lot of jokes into, into this book. Um, but he says this really was his work in teaching. How do we make sure our yarmulkes don't become something that separates us from heaven, separates us from the Holy One? More on this point, his children, his children being Rufruman, uh, tell the story that when they were little kids, he would stand them up in a line and he would have them uh, with a little like swearing in ceremony in which they'd repeat over and over again the message of Yoshua to the Jewish people before his death. That even if the entire nation was worshiping idolatry, I and my household would still serve the Lord. Uh, to the point that this line became a kind of mantra for them. And then at the end, he'd say to them, even if everyone in the world becomes religious, I and my household shall still serve the Lord. Which is to say that there's a lot of pressure going around on, on all sides, particularly when one signs on to a team, when you're wearing a jersey. You know, we've all been to uh, been to a Leafs game or a Chas V'Shalom Habs game, and we've seen the uh, energy going on in there when everyone is part of that uh, that same group. It can be wonderful at times. It can also be rather uh, complicated. There can be a lot of pulls into saying things or doing things you don't necessarily want to do. And being able to keep your head on straight and have a relationship of understanding why I'm doing this, what this means to me in particular, is incredibly, incredibly important. So when we think about our relationship between ourselves and, uh, and Medinat Israel, between ourselves and the non-Jewish people that we interact with in our lives, it's important to also have that firm rootedness in who we are fundamentally what we and what we believe as ourselves, because that is what will ultimately root us most firmly within not only our people, but ourselves. And that will make us the best servant of the people and member of our people that we can be as a result to that. And I would just add, you know, here in Canada, we do have a, an opportunity to do that in a way that other countries don't necessarily have. I was reading a fascinating book uh, fairly recently called um, No Better Home, I believe it's called, with a question mark at the end. It's not, it's not a statement, it's a question. Uh, and it talks about the uh, Jewish experience in Canada. And there's a powerful article in that that talks about the idea of, um, I'm going to get his exact terminology but this idea between, sorry, thick culture and thin culture, that's the terminology that he uses. And, you know, in, in the States, for example, there's a very thick ethnic culture. There, it mean, being an American means something that's very uh, transcends the individual. There's a lot that that really stands for. 
Uh, and oftentimes that's at odds with particular religious identities or ethnic identities. Those are very thin in parallel. You know, there really is a tension between being American and being and being Jewish for many, many, many people. Um, in Canada, there are actually studies that you don't have to worry about it as much here, that Canada has a very thick sense of ethnic cultures. That's true across the board. That's true for Jews. That's true for Muslims. That's true for uh, for different ethnic communities here as well. Um, and a relatively thin culture of the country itself, right? Canada was founded on uh, peace, law, and good governance, something like peace, order, and good governance, something along the lines. Uh, but otherwise, you know, we have free health care and we, uh, we occasionally watch the CBC every once in a while. But there's not really that sense of national identity there that's in contrast with the religious identity. And so they actually write that because of that combination of a thick religious ethnic culture and a thin national culture. So Canada is actually one of the best countries in the world to be someone who is Jewish. Because you have across the line, across the spectrum, Jews of all stripes, you have higher Hebrew literacy, you have a higher commitments to the Jewish people, you have higher uh, affiliation rates across the board uh, because of that. So we have a unique opportunity here in Canada to be able to really ask ourselves these questions and really say, am I being the best representative of the Jewish people, not only to my non-Jewish uh, friends and neighbors, not only in relation to the Jewish people who are living in Israel, who need representatives outside of Israel, but to myself as well. And we're really in a position where we can be introspective and ask those questions. And when we map that onto ourselves and we give ourselves that kind of approach, so then we're only going to be better servants, not only of ourselves, not only of our people, but of Hashem as well. And so what I hope that we've been able to gain from this is not necessarily an answer to the question of what is the best way to stim idea, uh, universalism with particularism, because that's going to be a different answer for probably every single person in this shear. But I hope we were able to gain a way of thinking about these questions that we can then take into our sukkahs to consider in our own religious lives. And then when it comes time to close up holiday and come out of the sukkah, to bring those lessons with us back out into the world and apply it not only in our relationships with ourselves and our families, but with our relationships with the non-Jews who are around us, and of course, our relationships with Hashem and with the state of Israel, which you know I, I certainly don't need to tell anyone here can use the unity and the strength from each and every one of us. Uh, so with that having having all been said, we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions, comments, concerns. Feel free to throw as many tomatoes at me as you would like from either side of the aisle, uh, but I am happy to uh, to respond and to have a discussion. The, you gave this year on our evening slot, 8.30 at night, so there are not too many Israelis here. So everybody <laughs> here pretty much... I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just commenting, that's <laughs> it. So it's a different discussion obviously you know the whatever it's uh that's uh i i do if i and i'll, I'll let other people ask because i don't want to you know but anybody any comments but okay until you get comments uh the the negation of the exile i think is a much less thing today it was of course that with the early zionists yeah. all believed in that i mean ben Gurion believed in that yeah. but uh but um you know today it's much less true, I think. Yeah, you, you still see twinges of it here, of it here and there, but it's much, much less common. I mean, you, I, I imagine you do see it in the, you know, in the religious Zionist community of Israel, that yeah. you see it there. But, um, you know, I guess I don't identify with that part of the community so well. Yeah. But, uh, anyways, okay. Any uh, comments, questions? Yeah, I see. iPad Toronto is raising their hands. I don't know who that is, but uh... I do. But take, he can talk. Okay, Vakasha. I have a I have a number of questions, comments, concerns. Um, going back to your Scharia comment about that you you come and you receive blessings. Are we talking about theurgy? In other words, you put five cents in the gumball machine and you expect you have to get a gumball or the machine isn't working. Everybody, Jew and non-Jew, comes to the temple to worship God. They get blessings as an automatic thing. You know, that's like a, like a very mechanistic. So that's a form of theurgy. 
Uh, you can comment or not comment on that. Going going further uh, in terms of models, I'm a Western Jew, which means I want to be persuaded to do mitzvot and halachot. I don't want Yorkdale to be closed on Shabbat. I want to choose not to go there. Um, and and uh, this is a mitzvot that you're forced to do. Uh, many people, including uh, Moish Halbertal, say actually has lesser meaning than mitzvot that you choose to do. And therefore, Israel has some of the best uh, examples of Judaism and some of the worst because they're trying to do coercion there because, you know, power corrupts and uh, there, there's a, that kind of corruption. The rabbis in in, Gol, in diaspora have to persi- persuade you why, to do so, why you want to do something, especially in the Western world where you don't have to belong to a religious community. Uh, I can be secular. I can be nothing. Uh, when it was a choice between Judaism and Christianity, most Jews chose Judaism. When it was a choice between Judaism and secularism, you saw most, uh, in, you know, 100 years ago, most people, most Jews chose nothing because the rabbis were coercive and basically mean and, and uh, horrible to them. So, um, you know, I, I'm a Western Jew, and I say so uh, openly and honestly. And the best example of that is being in the diaspora. And uh, Judaism as a minority religion, which is how it developed in the diaspora, uh, did wonderful things. And Judaism as a majority religion in Israel um, doesn't do a lot of good things. Um, and, and then a comment about... Um, uh, uh, it, Canada. Uh, one of the things Jews do well when societies broadly accept lots of other uh, uh, affectations, whether it's gays, whether it's women, societies that oppress women tend to oppress Jews. Societies that don't oppress women tend to be good for Jews. So I would say that that's actually the keystone as opposed to the multicultural thing. We are, we're, we're, the fringes are, are are free, tend to be good societies for Jews overall. You can comment or not comment or whatever you want. Well, first of all, thank you for all the comments. They were very they were very insightful. Um, I would say the first the first comment I'm not going to to address, not because it's not a, an important or interesting subject, uh, just because it would take us very very far left field. Suffice it to say that. You know the type of theology that that one holds will significantly impact what kind of answer that they give to the question of uh, theurgy versus non-theurgy, and you know how the uh, the metaphysics and the physics, shall we say, in terms. Fair of enough, but it does raise the question. That's all I'm saying. One hundred percent, and it's a, and it's an important question. I I have a philosophy background, so I'm very interested in questions like that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not I am pushing off the question, but I'm not doing so because I'm not interested in the question. Um. So, but it is a, it is a good question. I'll say on the on the end of Jew by choice or uh, religious by choice, shall we say, as opposed to being the default. Um, so Yorbat Nitsky has a wonderful book called How Judaism Became a Religion, where she addresses that really in depth, that Judaism moved from being this was the you know default culture that everyone's just kind of in to really being something that is, you know, Lamaisa, you have an option. That doesn't necessarily mean religiously one does, uh, again, depending on one's theology, but assuming one has, let's say, a traditional Orthodox theology, so there's not really a choice there because there is an expectation, but you're in a society where, you know, you can choose to do what uh, what you do, and that makes Judaism less of a uh, ethnicity, though it is also that, and more of it what we would consider a, a typical religion. A lot of people have have conversations about, you know, what's better to do mitzvahs because you're commanded versus do mitzvahs because you're uh, you're not commanded, um, and those are again important uh, important points to uh, to look at. But, but when it comes still, to that, you still have to be persuaded that I should listen to the commandment, which correct. is again, which is not what's going on in Israel in many cases. But correct. here, I can still choose not to listen to the the voice of of heaven. Exactly. And there I and there I would go back to Rav Shagar. Rav Shagar writes very much, and I did not share this particular piece of his, but he has another piece 
um, which is actually also reprinted in the in the English volume, um, where he talks about what he calls authentic Haredism, which is to say that he thinks that someone should be so deeply rooted in uh, their Judaism and believe it with such confidence that they're able to then go out into the world and be able to face other opinions head on. Not that they're scared of it, not that they're rejecting it, not that they're going and sequestering themselves in a you know self-made ghetto type of place, but they're actually going out into the world, being part of the world. And when questions come up, they're able to answer them. And when someone has a conversation with them about why they're doing this particular religious thing, they're able to have a civilized, respectful conversation, knowing exactly where they stand, being prepared to try to argue vociferously for what they believe, but not being so cut off that they're not uh, that they're also not listening to reason and not listening to the other side. Now, how to do that is a very difficult question. Rufigar offers uh, a few different suggestions in that particular essay. If I try to explain any of them right now, I won't be able to do it justice. But I think having that kind of approach is where we need is where we need to be. That regardless of which side you end up falling on, if you know what you believe and why you believe it, that means that you should be willing to have a conversation with the other side. And you know, that could mean try to convince them why you're right, or it could just mean I just want you to understand why I believe what I believe and why I do what I do. And even if that doesn't lead to us being on the same page at the end at least neither of us are afraid to back down from the other and we can actually admit that and have a conversation about it. When you're not willing to have that conversation at all is where I think you see a lot of issues. And that's as true in Israel as it's true in really, really any country where you see people who are talking around each other rather than to each other. So, but I think it's a very, it's a very, very important uh, comments to raise there and certainly very related to, uh, to this broader topic. And then the the third point, I think also there's there's aspects of both. There is the you know multicultural aspect. There's the uh, you know melting pot versus the tossed salad, as some have as some have written metaphorically. Um, and I think that that does play into giving certain opportunities. Certainly, it gives it gives a more of a natural opportunity for rootedness to be uh, to be cultured in someone who uh, who grows up and has that kind of connection. But I think you're right. Society also needs to be taking the buck as well. You can't also be in a society where there aren't these uh, these opportunities and where everything is, you know, pushed against particular types of people or or particular cultures. Uh, both need to be operating hand in hand for that to work in the most productive way. Um, I would go a little bit longer, but I think we only have two minutes left. So if someone else has a comment, I'd be happy to hear it. But I hope that sufficiently responded to your points, at least to the second two. You were great. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to add something? Otherwise, no, it's a, it's a busy time of year. It's a yash to everybody, really, for, for coming. At, uh, and uh, please go out tomorrow morning. I hope uh, if you can make it, my regular shear on the on the sitter, 9.15 a.m. tomorrow. And next week, Cholamoit uh we're going, I want to say full steam, six shearing we'll have next week. Mark Shapiro will be speaking Monday night. Uh, Dr. Sokolo and Rabbi Shulman on Tuesday. Uh, Thursday, Chazan Malavani. And then to Vizor HaBracha, Rivka Press Schwartz will be giving the uh, the Parsha Shir next week. And then, of course, my Shir again on the Siddur, please God, Hoshana Rabba on, uh, on Friday morning. So we look forward to uh, learning with you and uh, seeing you and want to wish everybody Chag Sameach and all good things. And thank you, Rabbi, and uh, all the best to, uh, you know, our friends on Parliament Hill. They've had a rough week on Parliament Hill in Canada. I think uh, we made That's world yeah. headlines this week, uh, the Canadian Parliament. But uh, no, no, we have a new Speaker of the House. What can we say? <laughs> but um, although yeah, no, he really. hasn't been elected yet. We don't have a new Speaker, though. We just don't have the old one anymore. But um, anyways, and thank you very much. And Lila to everybody. And we hope to see you soon. And invite your friends. Okay, be well. Thanks, Rabbi yeah. Kelman. Yes. Can you ask the speaker for next week's parasha um, if they could tell us why uh, the Zota Bracha is never said read on a regular Shabbat, how that developed? That's the one parasha never read on a regular Shabbat. It's this Shabbat read. happens to be, uh, you know, all the other ones are read on a regular Shabbat and read right. on Chagim sometimes, but this one right. 
unless it's like this year, it never falls in a regular Shabbat. No, this year, I mean, in Israel, it'll be read on, on Shabbat. That's all, but not. It's never read in Chutzlarts. And since we believe that there's a parallel community in Chutzlarts, at least three out of the four models believe in the parallel community in Chutzlarts, so we never hear read B'zot Bracha on Shabbos. I mean, I can ask her. I don't. I I don't know what her topic is, what she's planning to speak about. But um, you'll come. You you can ask her. Um, uh, but I'll yeah, see. You in she'll okay. be prepared. Okay, to be prepared. They, they, they don't need prayer. We're always ready for your questions. You know, so, uh, you know, that's it. Speakers got to be on their toes. You keep us on our toes. All right. Bye to everybody. Thank you. Okay. We'll see Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Good job. Okay. Rabbi, you, Rabbi, you asked what JET is, Jewish Education Through Torah. Mm -hmm. they've, been with, they've been with us, I guess, since I moved here, I think 1989, maybe 1990. Um, yeah. Have you met, by the way, Annie? Have you met uh, Rabbi Godley? No, Annie no, lives no. in Ottawa. I recognize I'm the name. You know. and she she the lives name, in Ottawa. Yeah. So everybody, everybody recognizes the name. <laughs> so where we make our our name known. So, anyways, it's a wonderful organization, and it does Jewish programs, cultural programs, Zoom classes. Uh, they deliver three thousand shlachmanas a year, maybe more. Is that program, and we have people all over, not we, but I, I kind yeah, of. And I, I'm, all... I'm running the uh, graduate student and young professional arm of it. So I have my work cut out, but it's it's been a wonderful time so far, and it's a beautiful, and it's beautiful communities here, I should say. And uh, it's a great organization. It's our look Are to you everything. In, you, you live in the same area? No, I live. <laughs> I live not within walking distance. Right, I know the Ottawa um, community. I know, I know, it's all, uh, all different. Okay. We're very compartmentalized, yes, but we yes. all love. We all like each other. We just, unless it's Hanukkah or Purim, we don't really see each other on the Hagim. Right. Yeah. Right. If you, if you think it's inconvenient, Rabbi Komen, when Bathurst only runs one way, you should try uh, try coming here and trying to get an event with everyone together. Yeah, no, I'm saying it's so interesting. I know that about Oh, I mean, I've been there not so often, but that the community is sort of is split in different areas. Here, you can pretty much, if you're willing to, you can walk from Sher Shemaim to the Beit. Yep. And I, it'll take you two hours, but it's doable. Robert Sajinu's done it. As far as I know. Those, those are like pretty much the sort of, I mean, there is on either side more, but the two main, the North and South Orthodox schools in the city. You know, yeah. from and uh, most of the people live in between. You know, so uh, anyway. But all right, but it's lacha. Okay, Lila um, to everybody. Bye bye. Shabbat shalom. And thanks for the opportunity. Yeah.